introduction, uh, Yoon, and it is really a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, Washington's one of my uh, favorite cities in the world. I've, I've never lived here, although I did go to graduate school here. Um, but I've been coming, you know, since I was a child. Uh, I think as a taxpayer, it's important to get here a couple times a year just to get your, your money's worth out of all the wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, things here. I was very pleased when the Koch Institute announced that the event would be in September. I said at least we won't have to put up with that July and August weather. Uh, but somehow we, we caught a little bit of the tail end of it. But we, I think Washingtonians are, are pretty familiar with that. Um, we're going to jump in. I'm going to speak for about... 45 minutes, uh, maybe a little less, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, I do want to get out on time. There's a rumor that someone else is giving a speech in Washington tonight, and I know we will. Some folks may want to hear that, so uh, we'll make sure we get everyone out um, in time to hear the other speech. Um, our topic tonight is um, uh, it has to do with uh, currency wars, and specifically, um, where are we now? Uh, we know where we've been. We know what the uh, crisis of... Uh, uh, 2007, the panic of 2008, the aftermath, the recession uh, that lasted into 2009, although I would take a different view and say that actually what we're experiencing is a depression, and we're still in it, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but just kind of summarize where are we now, and, and more importantly, uh, where we're going, both in terms of the dollar, Federal Reserve policy, um, and, and the international monetary system as a whole, and what are some of the uh, some of the forces in play? It is interesting that we're here right around the fifth anniversary of the um, the Lehman Brothers uh, AIG TARP uh, sequence of events, which I'm sure many of you uh, we all lived through, and many of you were involved in uh, from a policy perspective. We're not going to rehash all that because I think that's very familiar territory. But I was struck this morning. Um, there was an interview with uh, James Gorman, the CEO of Morgan Stanley, uh, uh, you know, on the fifth anniversary in Bloomberg. And of course, Morgan Stanley was the next domino to fall. We had seen Lehman fall, AIG fall. Uh, Morgan Stanley at the time was, was days away from collapse. And if they had collapsed, uh, Goldman Sachs would not have been far behind. Uh, and then probably Citi, and then probably B of A, and whether JP Morgan would have been the last domino standing or would have fallen as well. Uh, we'll never know, but uh, it was at that point that the government decided to drop a steel curtain between two dominoes and prevent that sequence of events. But no doubt that Morgan Stanley was the next in line, so they were literally days away from collapse. Um, and uh, Gorman said today, uh, you know, between the legislation, the regulation, the new capital requirements, et cetera, the chance of anything like that happening again in our lifetimes is extremely close to zero. And I almost fell off my chair. I mean, the, actually, the, the chance of happening is much closer to 100% uh, for, for a lot of reasons. And we'll talk about that. But what it told me is that, uh, as usual, Wall Street has learned nothing. Uh, the risk models they use are uh, worse than defective. They're, they're misleading. It's one thing to kind of point in the right direction with a little bit of um, variability, but pointing in the opposite direction is, is probably not a good thing. So don't, don't want to beat up on. Uh, on James Gorman, he's no really no different than the other CEOs on Wall Street. But I just shook my head and said, "Okay, well, five years later, it seems that Wall Street has learned exactly nothing." Uh, but we'll talk about why. Uh, so let me, uh, with that uh, kind of as, as a preview, let me uh, jump in. I want to spend a minute. We're going to talk about finance and economics and economic history, but just spend one minute on the national security implications of what we're talking about because. Um, there is no such thing as a strong national security without a strong dollar. If you have a weak dollar, a currency that's not widely accepted, a currency that's depreciating in value, you do not have uh, the kind of robust national security and defense establishment that you want. And uh, one of my roles is, uh, you know, I talk to the Treasury and, and the Fed and others, but I probably spend a lot more time with what I call the Virginia government, the, the Pentagon and the intelligence community and have some ongoing relationships with them. So I do get to talk to fairly senior people at the Pentagon about capital markets. That I don't, they don't ask me about weapons or anything, at least the kind that shoot. But uh, we do talk about this. And there's a growing awareness in the national security community, in the intelligence community, in the defense community, uh, that a, a threat to the dollar is a threat to national security, which is their, their mission. Um, but it's a difficult dialogue. You know, one senior Pentagon official told me, you know, the Treasury doesn't really like it when we talk about the dollar. Uh, the Treasury doesn't like it when anybody other than the Treasury talks about the dollar. But in 2009, uh, to their credit, the Pentagon sponsored a, the first ever financial war game. Uh, of course, the Pentagon's been doing war games forever. 
Uh, but this was one where the rules were you could have no, nothing that would shoot, so no submarines or missiles or cruise missiles or anything like that. The only weapons were uh, currencies, commodities, stocks, bonds, and derivatives. Uh, the teams were some that you would expect, you know, U.S., Russia, China. Uh, but we also devised a team that was composed of uh, Swiss banks and hedge funds uh, because they're players in this landscape. We did it at the um, – I was invited as a, at first as a, a consultant to help design the game because – uh, it's like any game, you have to have rules, and they had never done one like this before. They didn't need any help from me in wargaming, but they did need help in capital markets. Uh, so we came up with the teams and the rules and the scenarios, and we played it over two days up at the uh, Applied Physics Laboratory. It's about halfway between uh, Washington and uh, uh, Baltimore. Um, and uh, it was very interesting. This is all described in the book, so if you haven't read it, you'll have the opportunity to do so. I hope you uh, enjoy that. When uh, When we were done, I went home and... I said to my wife, um, I have good news and bad news. I said, uh, the good news is my team won. Um, bad news is I played China. So uh, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave that to you. But one of the things we said at the time, and uh, we, got, you know, we got pretty, when I say we, I had a small group of Wall Streeters that I recruited. I said, you know, you can't just have what I call the usual suspects, you know, the think tanks and the universities and the consultants. I mean, they're all brilliant people. That's not the point. But I wanted some real Wall Streeters who knew how to manipulate markets to come in and uh, and be the bad guys. And um, one of the scenarios we, we laid out at the time was that Russia and China would acquire gold and over time have enough gold to, in effect, discard the dollar and come up with their own gold-backed currency uh, and then insist on payment in that currency for Chinese manufactured goods and Russia natural resource exports. Uh, nothing that's going to happen tomorrow, but over a five-year scenario, if they were, they were pushing in that direction, you couldn't rule that out. Um, that was pretty roundly ridiculed, uh, laughed at, um, et cetera, but we played it out anyway. It was kind of interesting how it evolved. Uh, but since then, that was in 2009, this is 2014, so this is, uh, we did in March, so it was, uh, sorry, 2013, we did in March, so it was uh, four and a half years ago. Since then, um, Russia has increased its gold reserves by 60%. They've gone from, they had about 600 tons at the time we did this, they have 1,000 tons today. Uh, China has probably, tripled its gold reserves. They, they don't actually tell us. They, uh, they, they're non-transparent about it, but at the time they had just over a thousand tons, and today estimates are they have somewhere between three and four thousand tons. So, you know, watch what they do, not what they say. Their behavior is exactly consistent with what we laid out. I, and I said to someone at the Pentagon, I said, what's going to happen is someday your destroyer or your cruiser is going to pull up to a fuel depot in Singapore, and you're going to say, fill her up, and they're going to say, fine, pay me an SDRs. You know, the SDR is the special drawing right. That's the IMF world money. We'll talk about that, too. Uh, and so for the first time in history, you're going to have a forward-deployed military that you have to pay for in a currency that you don't print. Uh, and that was, again, thinking about that was a little bit of an eye-opener. So I'll leave it at that. But uh, again, as we go through the economics and the policy and all the things a lot of you may be more familiar with, we shouldn't lose sight of the important national uh, security aspects of this. Um, always good to spend a, a minute on a definition, and you know, we're going to be talking about currency wars. What's the definition of a currency war? Well, we've had floating exchange rates since the mid-1970s. Uh, so people say, well, what's new about floating exchange rates? Are currencies getting stronger? Currencies getting weaker? Uh, that's been around for 40 years. There's nothing new there. What's, what do you mean currency war? Um, here's the difference. Yes, exchange rates do fluctuate, and they fluctuate sometimes for good reasons. There are fundamental economic changes, whether it's uh, natural resource discoveries, changes in comparative advantage, technological breakthroughs, demographic changes, uh, natural disasters. There are reasons for exchange rates to fluctuate. A currency war is different. A currency war is when it's in done intentionally and maliciously as a matter of policy. So your currency isn't going down or going up because of these fundamental economic factors I described, you're making it go down because you're trying to achieve some trading advantage, some advantage against your trading partners. And what, what it amounts to basically, currency wars break out in periods of inadequate economic growth. When there's enough growth to grow around, when growth is robust, and you're the United States of America and some small trading partner, relatively small economy somewhere, tries to cheapen their currency to get a few more tourists or whatever, the U.S. doesn't worry about that. I mean, it's a minor annoyance at, at most. But when there's not enough growth, when everyone's fighting for growth, and that's certainly the situation today, it's a much bigger deal and countries are tempted to steal from each other. And when you cheapen your currency as a matter of policy, 
uh, to steal trade or advantage from your trading partners. That's a currency war. We're not in them all the time, uh, but when we are, they tend to persist for very long periods of time. I mean, a real simple example, uh, take aircraft manufacturing. You know, the U.S. has Boeing, Airbus has, uh, Europe has Airbus, Brazil has Embraer. Uh, and you say, you know, if you can cheapen your currency, uh, let's say you're a country like Indonesia, you need to buy aircraft, but you don't manufacture them. So you go shopping and you look at Airbus and Boeing and Embraer and see what's on offer. Well, the theory is if you cheapen your currency a little bit, that'll make your aircraft a little less expensive. It's like having a sale at Walmart and maybe you'll get the order and that creates some exports, that helps GDP, that creates some jobs on the assembly line. Uh, we need jobs in this country. so. That's the theory. It's very tempting to politicians, and you say, well, gee, what's wrong with that? You know, cheapen the dollar, sell some more planes, get some more jobs, help GDP. That sounds pretty good. Um, the, the problem is that uh, that's not the world we live in. If the U.S. could unilaterally cheapen the dollar and nobody else did anything, there might be some short-term advantage, but that's not the world we live in. What happens is we try to cheapen the dollar. Next thing you know, Europe's cheapening the euro, Brazil's cheapening the real. Uh, and that, that's when the currency wars come in. And for countries that can't or don't have the ability to cheapen their currency to fight the currency wars, they can do other things. They can put on capital controls. They can put on import tariffs, uh, export duties, et cetera. And so then that's how currency wars morph into trade wars. So, and then sometimes, in the case of the 30s, into a shooting war. So that's the, that's the, the fallacy of currency wars is that all advantage is temporary and you, you don't really get any permanent advantage. What you do get is inflation, uh, and that's actually what the Fed wants, and it's actually what the Bank of Japan wants. Uh, helping exports is, if it, if it happens at all, and, and it really doesn't, um, is at most ancillary. What you really want to do, remember, the U.S. is a net importer, right? So we cheapen the currency. Maybe it helps exports a little bit, but it makes all of our imports more expensive. And that's what the Fed wants. They want those higher import prices, have that feed through the supply chain and generate a little bit of inflation in the United States. And again, we'll talk about uh, why that is. So, so that's what a, a currency war is. We've had um, three in the past hundred years. I'm going to go through these quickly. Uh, there's a lot of history here, but in the interest of getting to some of the more technical and policy-oriented part of the discussion, I'll just uh, kind of recap these at a very high level. Again, hope you get a chance to read the book because it's all covered in a lot more detail. But Currency War I, 1921 to 1936. This was the famous period of sequential beggar thy neighbor devaluations. Uh, started in 1921 with the famous Weimar hyperinflation um, that you've all heard about, where you know the central bank just they, well, they actually printed so much money they ran out of paper, and at some point, uh, seriously, and ink, and at some point they started printing the currency on one side, not the other, to save ink. That's how much money they were printing, um, and uh, there were stories. You know, if you went to dinner. Uh, you paid for your meal at the beginning of dinner because it would be three times more expensive by the end of dinner. Uh, you know, and then a trillion uh, Reichsmarks for a loaf of bread, and then the next day two trillion. Well, what happened eventually is that it just actually went to zero. In other words, it wasn't even a currency anymore. It became litter, and it was swept down the sewers, and, and the currency had no value whatsoever. It wasn't even you know, a question of hyperinflation. It just was, uh, as I say, it, it was litter. Um, what happened next is less well known. Uh, it wasn't the end of Germany. Uh, Germany actually had a lot of assets. It had human capital, industrial base, transportation network, etc. cetera. Uh, Germany, over about a six-month period, went to a gold-backed currency. They got loans from the United States. They used the loans uh, to import what they needed to get their export machine going. They ran a trade surplus, used the surplus to buy gold, and used gold to back the currency. And from 1923 to 1928, Germany had the fastest growing major industrial economy in the world. Uh, so what that shows you is that uh, Germany's problem with hyperinflation wasn't the people or the industrial base or the potential of the economy. It was the central bank of the monetary policy. Once they got back to sound money, they grew very robustly. So I think a very good lesson there. Uh, 1925, um, uh, was France and Belgium's turn. Uh, the, the issue there was we had had a gold standard prior to World War I. It was abandoned in 1914, so countries could print money to fight the war. And now here we were after World War I, mid-20s, and countries wanted to go back to the gold standard. But it raised the question, at what parity, at what price of your currency to gold would you go back to the gold standard? Now, they had 
double the money supply to fight the war. So if you were, you know, you start out here as a parity between paper money and gold, and you double the paper money supply, and now you want to go back to gold, you basically have two choices. You can double the price of gold, which means cut the value of your currency in half, uh, massively depreciate your currency, or cut the money supply in half to get back to the old parity. Well, France and Belgium said, that's easy. We're going to cut our currency in half. We're going to double the price of gold. They went back to gold at a new higher price in terms of the French franc and the Belgian franc. Uh, this was extremely inflationary in France. I don't know if you saw the, the Woody Allen movie a couple years back called Midnight in Paris, but it portrayed, you know, it was 1925, portrayed U.S. expatriates living a very extravagant, glamorous lifestyle in Paris in the mid-1920s. Well, that was true. The French currency collapsed, and if you had dollars, you could go to France and kind of live like a king, even for a very modest amount of dollars. Um, England, interestingly, uh, did the opposite. Again, they had printed the money supply to get back to the old parity. They chose to go back to the old price, and they did cut the money supply in half, which was disastrous. It was highly deflationary, and that put England in a depression three years ahead of the rest of the world. Now, it's in, it was a nice sentiment. It's like, hey, you know, we issued the money at a certain price, and we feel honor-bound or duty-bound to honor that price. Well, then don't print the money in the first place. But once you've printed it, you kind of have to own up to the fact that you've doubled the money supply and you need to cut the value of the currency in half. And uh, the chancellor of the exchequer at the time was a fellow named Winston Churchill, um, great, um, great war leader, great prime minister, not such a great economist. Uh, and he later said that this was the greatest blunder of his life, that uh, he, um, he didn't understand the, the deflationary implications of going back to gold at the wrong price. It wasn't about gold, it was about the price. Come ahead to 1931, at this point, uh, UK has the most overvalued currency in the world. Uh, they were losing uh, trade to France and Belgium. Uh, their economy was in a complete state of depression. Finally, there was a banking panic in 1931. They had to go off the gold standard um, and devalue the pound. Uh, so now it's 1933, so we've seen Germany, Belgium, France, Italy, UK all devalue sequentially. Last guy standing is the United States of America. Uh, we, 1933, we just experienced the worst depression in U.S. history from 29 to 33. Uh, and President Roosevelt, literally within weeks of being sworn in in March, April 1933, um, devalued uh, the dollar against gold um, and uh, raised the price of gold from $20 an ounce approximately to $35 an ounce, so a 75% devaluation. Uh, but he did something very clever before then. He issued an executive order confiscating all the gold in America at $20 an ounce and made it a crime punishable by imprisonment and very steep fines if you held on to your gold. So everyone had to go to the post office or the treasury, hand in their gold. Uh, they didn't steal it. Uh, they kind of did, but they gave you $20 for your gold, knowing that they were going to reprice it to $35, but the government wanted to capture the profit. Uh, they didn't want the so-called hoarders or speculators uh, to profit on their gold investment. The government took the profit for itself uh, by buying at the low price and then revaluing it to the higher price. Fort Knox was actually built in 1937 to put all this gold that the government had confiscated in 33 and 34. Um, there's a very famous story where uh, um, Franklin Roosevelt was in, uh, in his bedroom in the White House in his pajamas and summoned the, Treasury, the, sec uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau at the time, and they were in the process of moving gold from $20 to $35 in small stages. And um, said, uh, the Secretary of Treasury comes in and the President said, uh, uh, well, Henry, uh, what do we want the price of gold to be today? Uh, he said, I know. Let's raise it 21 cents, because that's three times seven, and seven is my lucky number. And sure enough, the Secretary of the Treasury went out, called New York, and bid up the price of gold 21 cents an ounce that day. And over a period of months, they did get it up to $35. So that was the devaluation of the dollar. There was another round in 1936. And uh, so what do we get for these sequential currency devaluations? Well, we got the worst depression in global history, massive unemployment, collapse, massive uh, excess industrial capacity, stock market crash, uh, the civil unrest, and ultimately World War II, one of the worst periods of economic performance in, in global history. Uh, so not much to show for Currency War I. Currency War II, a little more contemporaneous. This is the 60s and 70s. Um, this came out of, uh, really started in 1965 with President Johnson's so-called guns and butter policy. 
uh, in the State of the Union address in, in 1965 and other speeches in early 1965, the President announced two policies. One was a very rapid expansion, escalation of the U.S. presence in Vietnam. Uh, the other was a series of social welfare and benefit programs that went under the title of the Great Society. Um, and this was called Guns and Butter. Vietnam was the guns and welfare was the butter. Uh, and Johnson said, you know, America is a rich country. We can afford both. Well, he was right. America was a rich country, but we couldn't afford both. This was the beginning of the twin deficits, the uh, budget deficit and the trade deficit that have been with us ever since. Um, it was only a matter of time before the money printing, because the Fed accommodated this massive government spending, led to inflation. Uh, but at this time, we were still under the Bretton Woods system, and gold was fixed at $35 an ounce. Now, U.S. citizens could not own gold. That was illegal. But our trading partners, if you traded with the United States, so you're Netherlands or France or Belgium, you trade with the United States and you run a trade surplus, you get dollars. In those days, you could take the dollars, hand them into the Treasury, and get gold, and we would send you the gold. Uh, and uh, actually, in uh, 1950, the United States had 20,000 tons of gold. By 1970, we were down to 9,000 tons. So you say, well, where did the 11,000 tons go? Well, it went 3,000 to Germany, 2,000 to France, 2,000 to Italy, 600 to the Netherlands, and so forth around the world. They actually still have that gold, by the way, uh, although we kind of have it because we store it in New York, so that's a separate issue. But um, that's, uh, that's what happened to the gold. What happened by the late 60s, early 70s, there was a run on Fort Knox. It was, it was very, very apparent that um, either the dollar, the inflation was going to get out of control and the dollar was going to be worthless and you would want that gold. There was also what was called the gold window, which meant that you could cash, if you were a trading partner, a country, and this, citizens couldn't do this, but central banks could, you could cash in $35 to get an ounce of gold, but there was a private market where the price was 42 So people were cash, buying the gold at 35 selling it at 42 It was a risk-free arbitrage. Obviously, the, we were going to drain Fort Knox. Fort Knox was going to be empty. Uh, in a matter of time, and so President Nixon, instead of going for a sound dollar, said, shut the window. Said, sorry, um, August 15, 1971, interrupted the most popular TV show in America, Bonanza, and uh, announced what he called the New Economic Policy. That's the same title uh, Lenin used in Russia in 1921, uh, the, uh, the New Economic Policy. And he had, he had three things. He had a 10 percent uh, surcharge on imports, Wage and price controls. Can you imagine a Republican, well, any president, Republican or Democrat, but Republican president announcing wage and price controls in the United States of America? You couldn't get a raise or raise a price without government approval. And the third thing, which he mentioned kind of en passant, was we're closing the gold window. And he said, uh, he assured Americans that, that, you know, that if they were home, their, do their dollar would be worth just as much tomorrow as it was the day before. Uh, just don't travel abroad. But uh, as long as you were home, it was all good. And this was supposed to create jobs, et cetera. Well, none of this happened. What happened over the next seven years was one of the worst periods of economic performance in U.S. history. We had three recessions back to back to back, 1973. I'm sorry, 1974, 1979, 1980. Between 1977 and 1981, we had 50 percent inflation, 5-0. The value of the dollar was cut in half. Gold went from $35 an ounce in August uh, 1971 to $800 an ounce by January of 1980. Um, unemployment sky skyrocketed, one of the worst stock market crashes ever in 1974. Uh, once again, none of the promises were met. None of the so-called uh, benefits of a cheaper dollar were realized. All we got was inflation and awful real economic performance. So, um, so that's kind of a, a synopsis of Currency War II. Uh, people don't seem to learn. Uh, and we're now in Currency War III. Um, now, by the way, going back to Currency War II in 1980, the dollar almost collapsed in 1978. Um, you know, a lot of people may not have been around then, don't have a first-hand recollection, but it came very close. Uh, Americans traveling abroad were routinely told, you know, whether hotels or restaurants, they didn't want dollars, you couldn't convert dollars. Uh, the United States, during the Carter administration, issued uh, U.S. Treasury bonds denominated in Swiss francs. They were the famous Carter bonds, but we had to borrow, U.S. borrowed money in Swiss francs because it wasn't clear that people wanted to hold uh, dollar-denominated paper. And that's, it, was a, it came very close to collapse. Why didn't it collapse? Why didn't the dollar collapse in 1979, 1980? Uh, the answer are two words, Volcker and Reagan. Uh, Paul Volcker came in as chairman of the Fed, raised interest rates to 19 percent, killed inflation, said, we're going to make the dollar a good place to invest. You can get positive returns on your money. 
President Reagan came in, cut taxes, cut regulation, created a positive business climate. The two of them together saved the dollar, and it really is almost like a plane just about to hit the ground, and you grab the throttle and pull it back, and you regain altitude. That was the beginning of what was called the king dollar, or the sound dollar policy, and that lasted all the way from 1980 to 2010, and it lasted through Republican and Democratic administrations. Uh, certainly Reagan, but even with uh, President Bush 41, James Baker, Secretary of the Treasury, President Clinton, Bob Rubin, as Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, this strong dollar policy lasted through uh, both parties and all these administrations. It wasn't until 2000, and, and so we were not on a dollar, sorry, we were not on a gold standard, but we were on a dollar standard. We said to the rest of the world, uh, we're going to maintain the value of the dollar, maintain the purchasing power of the dollar. And you are trading partners. You can do whatever you want, but if you want to anchor to the dollar, consider that a reliable store of value and something you can anchor to and adjust your own monetary policy accordingly. And far from perfect, but that worked very well. Uh, of course, the 80s and 90s, uh, we had very, very robust growth, another period of long sustained growth with, with relatively low inflation. Um, in 2010, the United States unilaterally abandoned the strong dollar policy, and the President uh, Obama's State of the Union address January 2010 made this explicit when he announced what he called the National Export Initiative. Uh, and the President said, um, it is the policy of the United States to double exports in five years. Bear in mind that nothing else was working. Consumption was, you know, this is 2010, right after the collapse, consumption was flat on its back. Investment, you're not going to get investment if people aren't buying the stuff you're producing. So investment had collapsed. Government spending uh, was under stress. We had this you know, $1.5 trillion deficits for a couple of years, but there was a limit there. And the Tea Party uh, a victory in 2001 really put an end to the government spending gravy train. So you look at the components of GDP, consumption, investment, government spending, all three of them were uh, misfiring. The only one left was net exports. So the president said, well, we'll drive the economy forward. We're going to double exports in five years. Um, he didn't say we're out to trash the dollar, but how are you going to double exports? You know, there aren't going to be twice as many of us. We're not going to be twice as smart. We're not going to be twice as productive. The only way you can double exports is by trashing your currency. And that is what the Treasury and the Fed uh, set out to do. Uh, and we said to the rest of the world, in effect, you're on your own. Uh, so now that we have no gold standard, no dollar standard, no Taylor rule, no standard of any kind. This is just wake up every day. Um, you know, I, mean, I, I see this on Wall Street and uh, with my investment banking uh, partners and hedge fund partners. You know, the, some of the smartest people in the world are spending all their time trying to read Ben Bernanke's mind. Uh, it seems like an enormous waste to me. We think we'd have smart people would have better things to do, but that is what's going on because there is no standard other than the uh, the Bernanke standard or the PhD standard. Um, give you a quick take on uh, what Ben Bernanke says about currency wars, um, and uh, he has a, he has a new theory. Now go back to currency war one, the 1930s. The problem there was sequential devaluations, and Bernanke said, yeah, we understand sequential devaluations are bad. You know, you devalue, then I devalue, then the next guy devalues. That's really suboptimal, and we don't get anywhere. He said, under Bernanke's new theory, let's all devalue at once. Um, and he, when he says all, he means the UK, Japan, the United States, and Europe. And when he says devalue, what he really means is ease, print money. And his theory is, if these four big economic blocks, US, UK, Japan, um, and Europe all print money at the same time, he says it's not a currency war because we're all printing money at the same time. So in theory, the, the relative value, the comparative advantage, the terms of trade shouldn't change that much because we're all printing together. So you get the ease without the currency war. And Bernanke actually used the phrase, he said, this is not beggar thy neighbor, this is enrich thy neighbor. Uh, so the more you print, the richer you are. Um, so that's Bernanke's theory. And uh, by the way, I'm not referring to this. He, he said this in so many words. You can look at his speeches and so forth. A um, couple problems with this, actually more than a couple. The first one is that Europe won't play. Uh, the U.S., Japan, and U.K. are all doing this. There's no question about it. But Europe has taken a different view. Europe is sort of making the structural adjustments they need. They'll print a little bit of money to, uh, to save the euro, but they won't print for the sole purpose of easing and generating inflation. So Europe's not quite on board. Um, but the other problem with it is, um, I'm sorry, um, okay, I'm, I'm missing a slide. So the other, um, the other problem with it, of course, are, are the BRICS. Um, in other words, it's, it's all well and good for the big four, 
to do this, but what about China and, and uh, Brazil and India and Russia and South Africa and beyond that, and Indonesia, Malaysia, Korea? These are all, these are all affected by these easing policies because if, if you want the big currencies to get weaker, these other currencies have to get stronger. That hurts their exports or if they want to peg to the dollar, we're printing money so they have to print money to maintain the peg so they get the inflation. Um, someone remarked, and I think there's a lot of truth in it, that uh, uh, ben Bernanke has uh, destabilized more regimes than the CIA uh, by, by exporting inflation, by printing money. And so actually this is not, uh, th this is true. The uh, part of the Arab Spring uh, was driven by inflation, increases in the price of, uh, uh, you know, bread and gasoline and so forth. We actually saw riots in Brazil uh, recently where uh, they, they had an inflation problem and they raised the price of public transportation, a bus ticket, and riots broke out in Sao Paulo. Well, that inflation was coming from the, uh, the United States as Brazil tried to fight the currency war. So this does have ripple effects around the world. The, the, the Board of Governors and the Fed Presidents say, you know, hey, our job is to run U.S. economic policy. Don't make us uh, worry about all these other countries. They have central banks. They can figure this out for themselves. That's a little disingenuous. When you manipulate the dollar, you manipulate every market in the world. And to, and to sort of wash your hands of the emerging markets and say you guys are on your own. I analogize this like a, a drunk driver who runs over a bunch of pedestrians and blames the pedestrians for being in the way. Uh, the, that's the, the bricks are just sitting there like, well, what are we supposed to do? You know, we have 20% unemployment in South Africa. We're supposed to raise interest rates uh, to keep our currency from crashing. Um, maybe, but uh, why can't we have uh, a sound dollar instead of a heavily manipulated dollar and then make it easy for our trading partners to figure out what we're doing? Um, I want to jump into a little bit of the economic theory behind all this and start with one of my favorite authors, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Um, he has a great quote. He said, the, uh, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. Um, and that's the test that economic uh, analysts and policymakers are going through today. And here are the, here are the two opposed ideas that, that you need to bear in mind. A lot of people say, you know, inflation's under control because it's kind of 1%. That's not bad. It's actually below the Fed's target. And some people talk about deflation a little bit. The way to understand it, we have inflation and deflation going on at the same time, two opposite ideas happening at the same time. The deflation is natural. It's what happens in a depression for, because of deleveraging. So what's deleveraging? Well, I have to sell assets to pay off debt. When I sell assets, it tends to depress the price. I pay off the debt, but prices are going down, so now I have to sell more assets to pay off more debt, et cetera. And you get into a, a debt deflation cycle uh, until you've liquidated everything and prices hit bottom and the kind of people start looking around uh, for bargains again and the cycle starts to turn. But it can go a very long way. And Irving Fisher uh, wrote about this in the 1920s in his debt deflation cycle uh, theory of the uh, Great Depression. But opposing that, we have inflation coming from policy. The Fed has printed uh, over uh, $2.6 trillion in the last four years. At the beginning of the crisis, their balance sheet was about $800 billion. Today, it's up around $3.4 trillion. Uh, and heading north, by the way, heading for $4 trillion at a very rapid rate. So people say, well, how could you print you know, $3 trillion and not get inflation? And we'll come back to that. But what, what's actually going on is we have sort of a notional 5% deflation and a notional 5% inflation, the deflation from deleveraging the inflation from policy, and they're pushing against each other, and they're canceling each other out. So the net of the two is this kind of 1% that you see in the data, but it's not stable. Uh, you've got these two forces, and one of them is going to prevail. That's going to snap, and it could snap either way. It could go into much more rapid inflation or much more serious deflation. Um, and so that's very, very important to bear in mind. So again, using Fitzgerald as a guide, don't think we have well-behaved price indices. I understand it as a seismograph under, on top of the San Andreas Fault when it's quiet, knowing full well that you could have a massive earthquake at any time. Um, kind of the monetary policy roots of this, here's uh, the basic statement of the, the quantity theory of money. Now, you all learned this in your first week of, uh, of macroeconomics, but it's, the equation is MV equals PQ. M is your money supply. V is the velocity. Velocity is just the turnover of money. So, you know, I go to the bar tonight and I leave a tip and the bartender takes the tip and takes the taxi home and the taxi driver takes the fare and puts gasoline in his car. 
that dollar has velocity of three because one dollar supported three dollars of goods and services, the tip, the taxi, and the gasoline. But if I stay home and don't spend any money, my money has velocity of zero. So, um, and I you know, remind people, three trillion dollars times zero is zero. In other words, if you don't have velocity, you don't have an economy. So uh, basically, money supply, how much money is there, times velocity, how quickly is it turning over, equals the nominal GDP, the gross dollar value of all the goods and services in the economy. And nominal GDP has two parts. Uh, Q is the real part, and P is the price index, so inflation or deflation. Um, and Milton Friedman looked at this equation and said, well, this is kind of easy uh, to solve in the sense, from a policy perspective in the sense that a mature economy like the United States can really only grow about 3.5% a year. It's just the sum of uh, increases in labor force participation plus increases in technology or uh, productivity. How many people working? How productive are they? That's how fast the economy can grow. Well, our population increases about 1.5% a year, and uh, productivity increases about 2 2.5% a year. So you add them together, you get 3.5%, 4%. That's the most the economy can grow. And we want P to be 1. Uh, one, any number times one is itself. So one means no inflation, no deflation. So P of one is ideal. Uh, and Friedman believed that velocity was constant. So he said monetary policy is a very simple thing to figure out. If the P can only grow about 4% a year, or sorry, if the, if the real economy can only grow about 4% a year, and you want no inflation or deflation, and velocity is constant, all you have to do is increase the money supply about 4% a year, and you'll get 4% real growth with no inflation or deflation. And Friedman used to joke that we don't need a Board of Governors or Federal Open Market Committee, just get a computer to increase the money supply about 4% a year. Now, there's more to it than that. There's leads and lags, and um, sometimes labor force participation increases faster if you're coming off a recession. But, but that was the basic idea. So let's look at what's been happening in the real world. So, so here's your money supply. Now, notice from uh, 1980 to 2008, it grows at a very slow, steady pace, exactly what Friedman was prescribing. Uh, all of a sudden, in 2008, it goes vertical. It takes off like a Roman candle. That's QE1. Uh, then it goes sideways a little bit. There was a gap, and then the next vertical leg up is QE2. Uh, QE2 is over in June 2011, uh, but by September 2012, the Fed was back at the printing press, and they announced Q, uh, QE3. Uh, and you see the beginnings of QE3 there. I have to update this chart constantly because it, that QE3 is going, it's actually off the charts now. I think we're over 3.2 trillion. But if I came back next year, I'd have to, I need a, a, one of those algorithm scissor lifts to kind of show you where the money supply is. But so this is what's happening to the money supply. It's gone up uh, almost 400% in four years. So remember, Friedman said, well, the money supply should grow about 4% a year. If we don't want inflation, here the money supply has grown 400%. So why don't we have 396% inflation to go with our 4% real growth? Well, here's the answer. Friedman was wrong about velocity. Velocity is not constant. Velocity is imploding. Uh, we haven't seen anything like this since the um, uh, early 1930s. So you can understand monetary policy is a desperate race between increasing money supply and decreasing velocity. You go back to the equation. Your M is going up, but your V is collapsing. And uh, if, if, your M's not go if the V is collapsing and the M is not going up, then the real economy is going down. So this is really um, uh, what's going on and why the Fed's printing so much money and why we haven't had the inflation one would expect, because uh, the turnover of money is not there. People are just not borrowing it and they're not spending it. So um, here's uh, I like to keep my equations simple so I can understand them. but. Um, here's one way to think about monetary policy. I, I show you 1 plus 3 equals 4, and 3 plus 1 equals 4. Take the first term to be uh, nominal, uh, uh, sorry, take the first term to be inflation, uh, take the second term to be real growth, and the combination of the two is nominal growth. So 1% inflation plus 3% real growth gives you 4% nominal growth. Uh, the Fed has to get to 4%. If we don't get to 4% nominal growth, we're going to default on the debt because the deficits are increasing faster than that. And remember, deficits are nominal. If I borrow a dollar, I owe you a dollar. It doesn't matter if it's worth a dollar ten or ninety. I mean, it kind of matters. That's an important fact. But contractually, I owe you a dollar. So the United States government owes nominal debt. If we don't have nominal GDP, we can't pay the nominal debt. 
Now, the Fed would like 1 plus 3. They'd like 1% inflation and 3% real growth, but they'll take 3 plus 1. They'll take 3% inflation and 1% real growth, and that's really their goal right now. They've thrown in the towel on real growth. They're just going for inflation because they have to get to 4, because if you don't get to 4, we can't pay the debt. Um, so what the Fed is really trying to do is bend this curve. They're trying to bend the velocity curve. Now, they can make money supply whatever they want. They can dial this up or down. Trust me, they, they can hit this target. But this is psychological. They have to basically lie to you. They have to engage in propaganda uh, to bend the velocity curve, to make you want to spend more money than you're actually doing right now so that they can get the nominal growth they need to pay off the debt. So how do you bend the velocity curve? What, what is the, uh, the, the, the policy here? And as I mentioned, it's, it's an exercise in propaganda. Two ways to do it, uh, two tools, that is. The first is negative real rates. Negative real rates is when inflation is higher than the nominal rate. Um, that's good because if you're a borrower in that world, you actually pay the bank back in cheaper dollars. That's better than zero interest. That's the bank paying you to be a borrower. So ideally, the Fed would say, well, 2% on the 10-year note and 3% inflation, negative real rates of 1%, that's a very powerful inducement to go out and borrow. The other thing they want to do is deliver an inflationary shock. Now here, the Fed has said ad nauseum that their inflation target is 2%, and you know, 2%, 2%, 2%, every speech. They I mean, talk about 25 as one of their uh, interim threshold goals for um, ending quantitative easing or raising rates, but uh, just take 2% as their stated target. Well, if I promise you 2%, and I deliver 2%, there's no change in behavior. I've exactly met your expectations, so there's no reason for you to change your behavior. What I have to do is lie to you. I have to tell you 2% and deliver 3%. That's a shock. Now you're like, oh, gee, inflation's out of control. Better go buy a house, buy a car, buy a refrigerator, uh, do whatever. So that changes behavior. So 3% inflation with 2% or 2.5% on the 10-year note is a negative interest rate, which is a powerful inducement to borrow. And it's also an inflation shock, which is a powerful inducement to spend. And the idea of 3% inflation is to get the borrowing and the lending and spending machine going again, try to get nominal GDP back to trend, make it self-sustaining, withdraw policy, substitute real GDP for nominal GDP, get real GDP back to trend, and we all live happily ever after. Um, this is what the Fed is trying to do. They're going to fail, but um, it's important to, to you know, if you want to understand policy, it's important to understand what they're trying to do, why they're trying to do it. Then when you see them failing, it's very easy to forecast monetary policy because they're just going to do more of it till they get what they want. Why do they have to get this? Well, why do, why do they have to have inflation? Uh, what's wrong with a little deflation? Well, here's what's wrong with it. This is actually the Fed's worst nightmare. The, the government, you know, in economic theory, inflation and deflation, you know, prices are going up, prices are going down, so what? You know, you, you get a raise or you don't get a raise or you get a little benefit or they're winners and losers. It would seem like a normal um, economic process. But the government's view of inflation and deflation is asymmetric. They have to have inflation. They cannot have deflation. Here's a world, here's an interesting world. I call this through the looking glass. Here what we're showing is nominal growth minus inflation equals real growth. Now the way you normally see this equation, you'll see something like 4% uh, nominal growth minus 1% inflation equals 3% real growth. That's a happy world. That's a, that's a world of high nominal growth, low inflation, and pretty good real growth. But look what happens when you use negatives. Imagine a world of negative 1% nominal growth. So the, the gross dollar value of GDP is going down 1% a year. But 3% deflation. Well, when you subtract inflation, deflation is a negative. When you subtract a negative, what do you do? You add the absolute value. So minus 1 minus negative 3 equals plus 2, so, which is real growth. So here's a world where you have 2% real growth. 2% real growth sounds pretty good. That's not so bad. But look at nominal GDP. It's going down. Now your nominal debt's going up because of budget deficits and interest payments. So if your nominal GDP is going down and your nominal debt's going up, what's happening to your debt to GDP ratio? It's going up. So everyone's in Washington's patting themselves on the back saying, yeah, the budget deficit's coming down. It's really under control. Well, your debt to GDP ratio isn't. Your debt to GDP ratio is still going up because your budget deficit isn't coming down faster than, um, than uh, uh, the, the nominal growth. Uh, sorry, the nominal growth is not there in the denominators to support the fact that um, your budget deficit is coming down. So your, your deficit is, st your debt is still going up. Your nominal GDP is not going up enough. 
your ratio is going up, you're still on the path to Greece, even with a declining budget deficit. So what I focus on is the debt to GDP ratio. There are other reasons the government can't have uh, deflation. One of them is they can't tax it. So imagine you make $100,000 a year and your boss gives you a $10,000 raise and prices are constant. Okay, so you just had a $10,000 increase in your real standard of living. You got $10,000 more and prices are the same. Except what happens? Well, the government comes along and takes half. They take $5,000 and you get the other $5,000. But imagine an opposite case. You're making $100,000 a year. You don't get a raise, but prices drop 10%. Well, you had the same $10,000 increase in your standard of living. Your salary didn't go up at all, but the price of everything you buy went down, so you're better off. Except that now you get to keep the whole $10,000 because the government doesn't know how to tax deflation. So deflation can increase the real standard of living of the American people, but the government won't allow it because they can't tax it. It destroys tax revenues. So there, so th that... The fact that debt to GDP goes up when nominal GDP is negative, the fact that the government can't tax it, there are other consequences, uh, but suffice to say that the government has zero tolerance for deflation, therefore they must have inflation, and when you see deflation on the horizon, you can bet that the Fed will keep printing because they have no, no other way around this. So how does the, uh, I talked about this 3% inflation goal, um, how does the Fed actually accomplish this? Well, here's their toolkit, you know, they cut interest rates starting in 2007, uh, quantitative easing started in 2008. Uh, communications policy, I call it propaganda policy, in 2008. Currency wars began in 2010. Um, Operation Twist, changing the maturity structure of the Fed balance sheet in 2011. They announced nominal GDP targets in 2012. Uh, and on 2013, of course, we have the famous taper debate. We'll find out on September 18th what's going to happen there. Um, my own view, and it's a very close call, my own view is the Fed won't taper, and I base that on the, fact, on the Fed's own announced criteria. If you look at the criteria the Fed laid out for whether they would taper and what the economic performance of the economy has actually been, your conclusion would be that they won't taper. Uh, but they might. I have to admit it's a very close call. There are two schools of thought led by Jeremy Stein and Janet Yellen. Um, if they do taper, if I'm wrong, and they do taper, they will be tapering into weakness. So you might even expect a recession in 2014. By the way, everyone's like, when's this, when's this expansion going to pick up steam? Guess what? It's four years old. Uh, we're probably ready for a recession. Average life of an expansion is about 58 months. So um, the Fed will be tapering into weakness. We may get a recession in 2014. Uh, I don't think they will taper, but if I'm wrong and they do, they're going to expand asset purchases by probably April and May of 2014. In other words, it'll be QE4. Um, the problem with manipulation is there's no way out. Fed has no good way uh, out of this. So this is kind of an over economic overview of what the Fed's doing, uh, why they're doing it, and how you can understand policy going forward. Um, what could possibly go wrong with this, uh, all, this, all these brilliant economists over at the Fed? Well, they're making a lot of mistakes. The first one is... Uh, the Fed doesn't really distinguish between the dynamic and, and, the, and the static. Uh, the Fed would look at this automobile uh, you see here and say, you know, that automobile's in great shape. There's not a scratch on it. Um, engine runs fine, a nice tank of gas, brand new tires, et cetera. But, of course, we all know what's going to happen next. That car's going to crash and burn and kill a lot of people and burst into flames. Um, but it, the Fed really doesn't use the right models. They use what they call stochastic general equilibrium models that don't take into account, um, uh, you know, exponential effects, recursive functions, and kind of what we call the black swans. So they're, they're using the sort of wrong methodology. Uh, I liked another uh, metaphor, but they're not really metaphors because the science is, is the same. Uh, the Fed thinks they're playing with a the thermostat. They can dial the, you know, the house is a little too cold, you dial it up, the house is a little too warm, you dial it back down again, it's linear, it's reversible. Uh, but what the Fed is actually doing is they're playing with a nuclear reactor. A nuclear reactor is a dynamic, critical state system prone to catastrophic failure. Now, you can dial a nuclear reactor up or down, but you better know what you're doing because if you get it wrong, you're going to melt it down, you're going to have a catastrophe, and that's irreversible. There's no such thing as a melt up of a nuclear reactor. And one of my great concerns is the Fed has all the wrong models, misapprehension of the statistical properties of risk. They think they're playing with a the thermostat and they're actually playing with a nuclear reactor and they risk collapsing our confidence in the dollar. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip, uh, I'm gonna skip the science class. Uh, 
and kind of get to the end game. The, um, uh, so we have this, uh, uh, the, let me just summarize by saying there's, there's good reason to believe that we are looking at a potential collapse of confidence in the U.S. dollar and indeed the entire international monetary system. The international monetary system is based on the dollar, so if the dollar goes, the system goes. That's not meant to be a provocative statement. The international monetary system has actually collapsed three times in the past hundred years, in 1914, 1939, and 1971. So this would be the fourth collapse in hundred years, so not that infrequent. Um, and when the monetary system collapses, it's not the end of the world. We don't all go live in caves who do canned goods and all that. What happens is the major trading and financial powers get together, they sit down, and they recut the deal. That's what, what's called the rules of the game. So what I want to think about a little bit is, since we can see the collapse coming, is what, would the new, what are the new rules of the game? What would the international monetary system of the future look like as a result of a sort of a new Bretton Woods style conference uh, in the face of, of a collapse? And I've got four scenarios here, multiple reserve currencies, SDRs, gold, and collapse, uh, followed by something worse. Multiple reserve currencies, the idea is, you know, in, in, two, in 2000, 70% uh, of international reserves were held in dollars. Today that number is 60%. Uh, it's trending down. So imagine a world where the dollar goes below 50%. Maybe it's 45 or 40%. The euro comes up. You know, the Australian dollar and Canadian dollar were just recently admitted by the IMF as official reserve currencies, so they have a larger role. Uh, and we end up in the situation where, you know, you got a whole bunch of reserve currencies. I call it the Kumbaya solution. We all just get along. Um, this is, uh, this won't work, this is unstable because there is no anchor. Uh, there's no gold, there's no dollars, so instead of one central bank behaving badly, you'd have five or six or seven behaving badly. I think this would exacerbate rather than mitigate the currency war. So it's something that's favored by academics, but it doesn't really solve any of the problems we've been discussing. Uh, the next one, this is the one preferred by the elites. When I say elites, um, it's not a deep, dark conspiracy. You know, finance ministers, treasury secretaries, academics, uh, central bankers, other policymakers. This is the SDR. The SDR is a special drawing right. Uh, it's really, it's not understood, it was understood by very few people, but it's unbelievably simple. Um, the way to understand it, the Fed has a printing press, they can print dollars. The European Central Bank has a printing press, they can print euros. And the IMF has a printing press, they can print SDRs. And that's all it is. It's world money. They can print as much as they want. They hand it out. They can reflate and reliquify the global economy. Um, the, the IMF actually has a 10-year plan to make the SDR the global reserve currency. Again, not a secret. You can find it on their website. Um, I want to give a quick example because I know this, is, this group is uh, attuned to uh, policy, um, but how the SDR is already sort of creeping into our, our system. Um, in, uh, the United States Treasury got authority to um, provide $100 billion to the IMF. This was legislation passed in 2009. As part of this global bailout, you know, Christine Lagarde went around with her Louis Vuitton purse and said, fill her up. Um, and so, uh, but I want to just illustrate how if the United States meets its commitment, we've made the commitment, it's in law, we haven't funded it yet. Um, kind of how the math works if the U.S. were to meet this commitment. Now, the SDR is a basket. It's not backed by anything. There's nothing behind it. But the value of an SDR expressed in dollars is a basket. It's got a number of components. Each component has a weight. And all you do is you take the component, like sterling or yen or Swiss franc, you convert it to dollars at the current exchange rate, you multiply it by the weight, and that gives you a dollar result, and you add up the dollar results, and that's the value of an SDR. So, um, so what will happen when the United States Treasury gives the $100 billion to the IMF? Well, what a lot of people don't realize is the IMF doesn't give us a note for $100 billion. They give us a note for SDRs. We then end up with an SDR promissory note. Uh, and that would be converted at the SDR value on the date we make the loan. So imagine uh, the basket. So I'm just sort of saying, let's say the euro is $1.35. Uh, it's 100 yen to the dollar. They, pound sterling is $1.55. With that basket, the SDR would be worth $1.52.4. If we give the Treasury 100, sorry, we give the IMF $100 billion, they're going to give us a note for 65.6 billion SDRs. Now, imagine a few years go by, the note matures, and the Treasury goes down to the IMF, says, I got my 65 billion SDR note here, please cash it in. But imagine in the meantime, all those exchange rates have changed, and the dollar has weakened. Remember, that's U.S. policy. 
So let's say that the new basket, the euro is now worth a dollar forty. Uh, the Japanese yen is ninety-five to the dollar. Pound sterling are a dollar sixty. Uh, with those exchange rates, lower dollar, cheaper foreign, uh, higher foreign exchange, the SDR would now be worth a dollar fifty-five point seven. So when we cash in the sixty-five point six billion SDR note, what we get back is hundred and two billion. So we loan them hundred billion, but we get hundred and two billion back, you know, plus interest. I'm leaving the interest out of this. Uh, we would the treasury would actually make a two billion dollar profit on a cheaper dollar. Um, but think about that. The Treasury is the sponsor of the United States dollar, and here they're going to enter into a transaction with the IMF where they're in effect shorting the dollar. Uh, we're, sh we're shorting our own currency. We'll make a $2 billion profit, in my example, if the dollar goes down. This is like finding out that Mark Zuckerberg is shorting Facebook. Uh, I don't uh, know how the Treasury would explain it. Maybe you'll bump into Jack Lew and ask him how he feels about shorting the dollar. But that's the effect of um, doing an SDR loan with the IMF. Uh, the next slide is uh, the United States. I talked about this $100 billion uh, facility. Um, President Obama sent a letter to Congress April 16, 2009. Uh, he requested these U.S. funds, and he said this is primarily, this is a quote from the President, primarily to developing and emerging market countries facing economic and financial difficulties. So that's what he told the Congress he wanted the money for. Uh, Barney Frank and Richard Luger were the key sponsors. Uh, it was inserted in a war spending bill, of course, why not IMF funding in a war spending bill, um, passed by Congress June 16, 2009. Um, by the way, subsequently, Luger, of course, was uh, confronted with a Tea Party challenger, lost a primary. Barney Frank retired. Uh, Madame Lagarde, uh, managing director of the IMF, was asked how she felt about losing Barney Frank and Richard Luger, and she uh, said a very famous quote. She said, we will miss them. Um, but uh, so now, uh, so what did the IMF do with the money? Uh, well, what they did is they, um, uh, if you look at the total IMF loans, credit lines, et cetera, uh, 90 percent, sorry, 91 percent of all the IMF loans and advances either went to bailout Europe or to Mexico. Uh, only 9 percent went to the rest of the world. So I leave it to you to decide whether the president was entirely candid with the Congress when he said this is primarily for developing and emerging market economies. You know, you don't see Korea, Indonesia, India, um, Brazil, um, Thailand, Malaysia. You don't see those countries getting more than 9 percent of the IMF money. This money basically went to bail out Europe. So that's another thing where, again, I think the American people were a little more aware they might raise a few questions. Um, third outcome is the gold standard. Um, I'm just going to go through this very quickly. Uh, all gold standards are a relation between paper money and gold. Um, but you have to ask yourself a couple questions when you set up a gold standard. First one is, what's your definition of money? Because we have M0, M1, M2. These are technical definitions. They're all different. So you have to pick one of those to be your, your money. Uh, the second one is, what's the proper reserve ratio? Do you need a hundred cents on the dollar of gold to back all the paper money? Well, a lot of gold bugs would say yes, but historically that's not true. England ran a very successful gold standard in the 19th century. We have 20 percent backing in the United States through most of the 20th century. was on a gold standard with 40 percent backing. So history says you can have 20 or 40 percent backing uh, and, and that works just fine. Uh, and the third thing is which nations are included. Um, the, the simplest way to understand that the U.S. could do this on its own but it would be a blunder because if we had a, a gold standard, a dollar backed by gold, and we were the only one doing it, all the other cu currencies in the world would essentially be worthless. Nobody would want anything other than dollars, which would be extremely deflationary because the other cu currencies would not be uh, desirable, and it would repeat the blunder Winston Churchill made in 1925. So, um, so I want to look at uh, what, with those criteria, look at actually where the gold is. Um, if you take the 17 members of the European monetary system, those who back the euro, they have 10,000 tons. The United States has 8,000 tons. The IMF has about 3,000 tons. You see China, Switzerland, it kind of tails off after that. So uh, the good news for the U.S. and Europe is we still have all the gold, and I think we will uh, have the largest voice by far uh, if there is a new international monetary conference with one footnote, which is China is non-transparent. So that China bar, that 1,000 tons I'm showing there, probably closer to 4,000 tons. We'll probably learn that a year from now when they update their figures. So China has bought themselves a very big seat at the table. Um, here, are the implied, here are the implied prices of gold using the criteria I mentioned. Along the bottom, uh, if you, G is for global, M is for money supply, so I'm showing M1. 
and the per percentage in uh, brackets is the backing. So the first one, the global money, uh, global M1, 40% backing, that's about $7,000 an ounce. In other words, that's, that's what the price of gold would have to be to support the money supply without deflation. Uh, so it's the non-deflationary applied price of gold. And you see all the way over on the right, uh, global money supply, global M2 with 100% backing is $44,000 an ounce. I'm not predicting $44,000 an ounce gold, uh, and I don't think that's necessary, but I'm just showing you the, the math uh, that you get to, the kind of implied prices you get to if you go back to a gold standard. And the last scenario is collapse, which I actually think is the most likely through a combination of wishful thinking, denial, delay, misapprehension of the statistical properties of risk and bad policy, will probably just blunder into a collapse, at which point the response would take the form of executive orders and, you know, if there's social unrest, probably some kind of uh, neo-fascism. Um, as a plug for my book, and I thank you very much. Thank you. I, I know we ran a little bit over. I'm, I'm, some of you may have to go, but I'm very happy to stay. And so if any of you have any questions, uh, we, we certainly have time. I think we have a couple of microphones around. So if you just raise your hand, I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone has. Yes, sir. Yeah, we, we just uh, learned uh, this past week that we now have the lowest labor force participation since 1978. Uh, kind of a chicken and egg question, to what extent is that participation a symptom of, uh, you know, a depressive economy and zero velocity of money, what, or to what extent is it a cause? What's, what's the relationship between them? Yeah, it's, it's a good way to frame the question, because a lot of these things are, are feedback loops, and it's hard to sort out cause and effect, but it doesn't matter. Each thing feeds into the other. So it's no doubt that low labor force participation is a symptom of a depressed economy and the reasons for the depression having to do with what's called regime uncertainty. You know, if you're a business person and you're responsible for, you know, a 10-year, $5 billion infrastructure project, so you've got to sign off on spending $5 billion, spending $5 billion now, investing $5 billion now with a 10-year payoff. And I say, okay, um, what are your taxes going to be? What are your health care costs going to be? What is your environmental regulation going to be? you know, on and on and on. You can't answer any of those questions. I'm not here to debate policy. You can debate the policy all day long. I'm just saying a business person can't answer those questions. And so they would prefer to sit on the sidelines, hold on to the cash until they see some clarity and resolution. So this was the problem in the Great Depression. You know, we had a very bad depression in 1920. Uh, industrial production collapsed, the stock market collapsed, inflation took off, unemployment skyrocketed. It was a disaster. Um, and the government response was to balance the budget and do nothing. That depression was over in 18 months and led to the Roaring Twenties, which is one of the most ro robust periods of growth in U.S. history. Because everyone says the Great Depression, I like to look at the Depression of 1920, it was over in 18 months. It was bad, but it was over. That was the real V, where you go all the way down and you come back up again. In the 1930s, and it was really Hoover and Roosevelt, there was amazing continuity between the Hoover administration and the Roosevelt administration. But, you know, I mean, they had, they had cotton price supports, and they took them away. Then they uh, devalued the dollar against gold. Uh, and then they tried to pack the Supreme Court. And then they had wage and price controls. And they turned, put them on, took them off. Business people didn't know what to do. And we're in a very similar period today. So we are in a depression. Uh, labor force participation is a big deal. Where it really plays into policy is, you know, the Fed stated a goal of 6.5% unemployment as not a trigger, but a threshold. They said, we're not going to raise rates until unemployment gets to 6.5%. Well, it's been coming down. It went from, you know, I think it's 7.1, or I may be off by a point there, but it has been trending down. We might actually get to 6.5%, but with uh, the, high, the uh, lowest labor force participation, um, uh, flat real wages, um, you know, uh, 20, uh, sorry, 15 percent unemployed, unemployed. I mean, imagine a world where uh, there's only one person in the economy working. So there's one person in the economy working, and he's, that person was looking for a job, and he got a job, and everyone else is staying home. Uh, in that world, unemployment is zero. Unemployment is zero percent, pretty low rate of unemployment. But obviously, you know, an extreme example uh, that that's not a desirable state of the world. So I think the Fed has got to wrestle with you know, they put a stake in the ground on these nominal targets of 6.5%, but what does that mean 
where labor force participation is going to approach 60, the number of people working in the United States today is about what it was in 1999. For all the growth and all the uh, increase in population, immigration, et cetera, we still have about 131 million people who have jobs. So the, this is a disaster. You have 50 million on um, food stamps, 11 million on disability, which is the new you know, unemployment, um, uh, 26 million unemployed or underemployed, uh, you know, looking for more hours, et cetera. I mean, these are, these are depression level statistics. Yes, sir, in the, in the back. Hi. How is it that the way that China manipulates our currency, how is that different than QE1, QE2, and QE3? Well, every, um, it's not in some ways. I mean, every country manipulates their currency to some extent. It's a policy tool. So you, you know, you have, you, you, you have tax policy, you have interest rate policy, you have monetary policy, and you have currency policy. So everyone does it to some extent. Now, the biggest currency manipulator in the world is the United States of America. Uh, it is true that China tried to keep a lid on the yuan, but China, it was kind of funny. They said, yeah, you know, China and the United States are the two largest economies in the world, one of the largest bilateral trading relationships in the world. So wouldn't it be cool if we had some stability in the currency between the two so you could make trading and investment decisions and remove the currency uncertainty? But the Fed didn't want that. The Fed wanted China to appreciate their currency because we wanted to cheapen the dollar, because we wanted to import inflation to meet those nominal GDP targets that I described. So what the Fed did, the Fed started printing money. Now, for so long as China wanted to maintain the peg, like, you want to maintain that peg. Well, if the Fed's printing money, and that money's going to China in the form of a current account surplus or portfolio investment or hot money inflows, China has to print money to soak up the dollars. You're a Chinese exporter, and you earn dollars. The People's Bank of China says, give us the dollars and we'll give you local currency. Well, the more dollars coming in, the more local currency they had to print. So what was happening is, as the Fed was printing money, the inflation that you would have expected to see in the United States was actually being exported to China. China was creating their own inflation by printing their money to soak up the dollars. Inflation is very politically destabilizing in China. Throughout 5,000 years, regimes have fallen, dynasties have collapsed around the subject of inflation. It was also a contributor to the Tiananmen Square demonstrations and massacre in 1989. And so finally, China blinked. China said, you know, by maintaining the peg and the Fed printing, we're going to get inflation. That's dangerous politically, so we're going to let the yuan go up. So the Fed won that round of the currency wars, but watch out because the stronger the yuan gets, the more inflation we're going to get back. So the blowback is going to be inflation in the United States. It's not here yet. I acknowledge that. but. Uh, but it's coming. So um, did China, you know, print money to maintain the peg? Is that a form of currency manipulation? Sure. But uh, they were, but there's no bigger manipulator than the U.S., which is trying to, which said, like, the more you, you want to print, we got to, our printing press is bigger than your printing press. And finally, we got China to blink. Uh, this will have to be the last oh, question. Sorry. Okay. Do we have, uh, um, yes, sir, right here, near the pillar. Yes, well, um, this has been a great uh, lesson in economics as well as history, but I want to go back briefly to even before the 20s. You have something in your book where you talk about where, uh, where, where Andrew Jackson abolished the second bank uh, yep. of the United States in 1836, right. and we had for 80 years no central bank and sort of competing private currency, sort of a quasi-system of free banking. And you say from 1836 to 1913, an almost 80-year period of unprecedented prosperity, innovation, and strong economic growth for that period, the United States had no central bank. Right. So is that the ultimate solution today? Uh, it's one solution. I, I don't think we need – I, I uh, have long advocated a lot of – reforms at the Fed, but you know, lately I'm thinking maybe it's just beyond hope and we should abolish the central bank. I don't think it would be a bad thing. Um, uh, you know, current, you know, what is a dollar? You know, look at a dollar. I was, you know, my first week of law school, they taught us uh, in contracts to always read the contract. Um, the paper dollar is your contract. If you read what it says, uh, right on top it says Federal Reserve Note. Uh, at least where I went to law school, a note is a liability and uh, not an asset. And if you look at the Fed's balance sheet, sure enough, dollars in circulation are liabilities on the Fed's balance sheet. They're on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. So you can think of a dollar bill, we all probably have one in our pockets, 
as a perpetual non-interest-bearing note of an insolvent central bank. Uh, the Fed is insolvent, by the way. They, they have a $3.2 trillion balance sheet. They have $60 billion of capital. So they're leveraged 50 to 1 with long-duration assets. They look like a bad hedge fund. But uh, they, they don't have to mark to market. But if you took the Fed's balance sheet and called up the primary dealers and said, give me prices on those assets and mark the balance sheet to market, the Fed's capital would be negative. So they're, they're insolvent today. So our so-called money is a perpetual non-interest bearing liability of an insolvent central bank. I don't know why that's so important, why we couldn't do without them. Uh, 